good evening, everyone. My name is Charlene Margo, and I am founder of the Parent Education Series, now a program of nonprofit, The Parent Venture. We are very, very excited and honored to be here with you tonight, the St. Matthew School community. And we have Greg Bear and Ryan, say your last name, Ryan. Rydzeski, you were very, very close. Rydzeski, Rydzeski, okay. <laughs> Um, with us tonight, who will be talking with you about their new book, When You Wonder Your Learning, Mr. Rogers' Enduring Lessons for Raising Creative, Curious, and Caring Kids. Welcome, Greg and Ryan. We're so glad to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much to Charlene and Bev and Mark, and thank you so much to all of you for being here. Uh, I'm just going to get my screen started right here. Greg, can you see what uh, you should see? I can see well, and I just want to uh, remind everyone. So along the way, if you have comments, questions, ideas, please use that chat. We will be monitoring and try and respond along the way in addition to the time that we'll have uh, at the end of this hour. So hello, everyone. I'm Greg. You just heard from Ryan. And this is a little bit how we feel tonight, right? We're parents ourselves. We know what it is that you're juggling in your lives personally and professionally and probably in all sorts of other realms and um, as was no noted in the introduction as a as a graduate of the University of Notre Dame I'm feeling a special anxiety that we deliver a really special evening with you and we're honored to be here with you tonight. Okay so I am guessing by virtue of the fact that you are here tonight most of you probably know who this is. This is Fred Rogers. This is the iconic television host of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which is a children's television program that aired from 1968 to 2001. Now, if you don't know who this is, if you don't know Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, that's totally okay. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. But we are curious, for those of you who grew up watching Fred on television, we want you to take just a moment to go back to that place. Maybe you watched Fred with your grandparent, or maybe you watched Fred with a neighbor. Maybe you watched Fred all by yourself. Wherever you were, I want you to just go back to that place for a minute. What's one word or one phrase that comes to mind when you think about watching Fred on television? You could just type your phrases, your words into the chat. Safe, kind, kind, peaceful, absolutely, friendly and warm, caring, soothing, comfortable, friendly, neighbor, inclusive, absolutely. So if you remember Fred, you probably remember him for the way he made you feel. He made you feel accepted. He made you feel special. He made you feel safe. You might also remember Fred's favorite number, which is 143. That was Fred's sort of code for I love you because there's one letter in I, four letters in love, and three letters in you. Fred and his television program helped millions of kids feel loved. And on the Zoom screens and on the slide right in front of you are two of those kids who felt that love. As was noted, I'm Greg. I'm the executive director of the Graybell Foundation and also co-chair of something called Remake Learning. We'll come back to that later. And my name is Ryan Radzeski. I'm a science and education reporter. And as you just heard, I'm a former elementary school teacher. I taught fourth and fifth grade. Uh, but all you really need to know about Greg and I, at least for tonight, is that we are children of Western Pennsylvania, where we both are right now. So just like Fred Rogers himself, we were born in this area. We moved to different parts of the country for a while, and eventually we found our respective ways home. So Fred, of course, was a national celebrity, but here in Pittsburgh, he felt like he was ours because he really was our neighbor. The Fred you saw on screen was the same Fred that we saw on the street. And so we grew up with this deep emotional connection to Fred that we know lots of you probably feel too. And just a few years ago, after years of research and lots and lots of giraffes on the cutting room floor, our book entitled When You Wonder, You're Learning was published. It's about Fred's enduring lessons and why they still matter. And along the way, you can imagine we learned a few things about Fred, and particularly as we asked the question, how? How did Fred do what he did? How did he create those deep feelings that so many of us still share today? And how did Fred use those feelings to nurture the tools for learning that matter in 2023? Most importantly, we learned a few things about how we grownups, we adults can follow in Fred's footsteps when it comes to sparking wonder and curiosity and joy. And that's what we wanna talk about tonight. Now, you're not gonna to need to memorize any of our lessons. We'll do an exercise at the end of our time together that we feel like we'll pull it all together. But we hope after spending some time with us in the neighborhood again today, 
you'll see why we're just in awe, as in awe of Fred now as we were when we were those little kids, but maybe not for the reasons that you think. So lesson number one, Fred Rogers was not a saint. Now, the first thing people ask us when we talk about this book is, was Fred really like that? And the answer, amazingly, was yes. Like I said earlier, the Fred you saw on screen was the same Fred you saw on the street. But that's different from saying he was a saint because Fred wasn't perfect. Like everybody else, Fred Rogers got angry. Fred Rogers definitely made mistakes. He didn't always get it right. Sometimes Fred even wondered whether what he was doing mattered at all. Fred Rogers was not a saint. But if you think about it, what's more useful than a saint? And what did we get in Mr. Rogers? We got a regular guy. Someone who, despite all the flaws that come with being human, committed himself to being the person children needed him to be every day of his life. So the Fred we saw on screen was not a saint, but a practice. It was the result of Fred's daily choices and his careful methods. And without a doubt, the greatest honor of this whole multi-year journey is having a foreword in the book from Fred's now late wife, Joanne. It's actually the last thing she wrote before she passed away. And in the foreword to our book, Joanne writes, no one worked harder at being Fred Rogers than Fred Rogers himself. So who was Fred Rogers and who was he working so hard to become? Well, Ryan, he was more than a nice guy in a cardigan. Fred was born in 1928 in a town called Lake Trobe, Pennsylvania. It's a small town just to the east of Pittsburgh. Now we're not gonna go too deeply into Fred's background. Some of you have maybe read in a biography or two that's out there. Maybe you saw Morgan Neville's amazing documentary, We Dare You Not to Cry, during the last 10 minutes of that film. Maybe you saw that Tom Hanks biopic. No matter how you've come back to Fred, there are a couple of things that all of us should know if we want to understand the neighborhood. And the first thing is this, that Fred actually hated television when he first encountered it. Can you imagine one of the first things he ever saw is like what you see in the slide, people throwing pies in each other's faces. And he hated seeing the technology being used in this way to demean other human beings. But at the same time, he saw the technologies of potential. He knew how this technology was attractive to young people. And he decided as he enrolled at the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary that he wanted to use this technology of television to minister to children, as he said. And it was his teachers at the seminary who said, well, Fred, if you're gonna do that, you better learn something about child development theory and practice. And those of you who are educators the, yourselves and spend a lot of time in the school grounds, you can understand why this is so important. So this is where Fred's story gets so really interesting because, because he ends up at a place called Arsenal Family Children's Center. It's a, it's a family and children's center that's still operating in the East End of Pittsburgh. And at this place called Arsenal, some of the world's most brilliant psychologists and psychiatrists and pediatricians all happen to be working in this same place at the same time. There are folks like Benjamin Spock, the doctor whose book Baby and Child Care remain, um, was. And, he, and that book is like one of the best-selling books of all time, second really in American publishing history only to the Bible. There was also Eric Erickson, whose work maybe you're familiar with um, around identity development. And most importantly, there was a woman by the name of Margaret McFarland. She was a psychiatry professor at the University of Pittsburgh and she became Fred's lifelong mentor and dear friend. And honestly, you would know Margaret's work so much better had she not been a female working in the academy in the 1950s and 60s. In fact, the New York Times as they've republished obituaries has republished an obituary about Margaret McFarland because of her profound influence in the field of child development um, theory and practice in the middle of the 20th century. So you see studying at this place called Arsenal and studying amidst all of these people like McFarland and Benjamin Spock and Eric Erickson put Fred Rogers at the cutting edge of child development science. And he took what he learned there and he blended it with original songs and stories and puppetry and even a physical set itself, the things that became Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. You see, every aspect of this program that we know and love so well is grounded in science. It's an incredibly overlooked part of Fred's legacy, but Fred was way more than a nice guy in a sweater. He's what today we'd call a learning scientist, and he was a learning scientist who was decades, decades ahead of, ahead of his time. So today we know more than we ever have about how children learn. 
as a field, what's now called the science of learning it includes everything from behavioral science to artificial intelligence, neuroscience, economics, and more. There are people and organizations and schools, just like St. Matthew, doing amazing work to figure out the methods and the conditions that are most conducive to learning. And what's really fascinating about this stuff you see on the screen to us is the degree to which it validates. In fact, the degree to which it even mirrors what Fred Rogers was doing 50 years ago right here in Pittsburgh. So take the title of our book, When You Wonder You're Learning. That phrase comes from a song of Fred's called, Did You Know? Some of you might remember it. I'll let Fred take a bar. Greg, can you just give me a, a thumbs up if you can hear this? Ah, that didn't work. I feel like I should sing this. Did you know? Oh, I'm getting thumbs up from other folks. So hopefully some of you can hear this. I, I can't hear it. Can hear it. I love this. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, as you all out there can hear it, it's a song about curiosity. It's a song about wonder. It's a song about encouraging children's uh, questions. Now, if you compare these lyrics to this quote from a research paper at the University of California, Davis, that says, curiosity may put the brain in a state that allows it to learn and return any kind of information, like a vortex that sucks in what you're motivated to learn and also everything around it. In other words, when you're curious, your brain starts to take in information. Mr. Rogers was right. When you wonder, you're learning. Now, this research paper, by the way, came out in 2014. Fred wrote, did you know, in 1979. We could spend all night talking about the ways in which learning science is just now catching up to Mr. Rogers. But the bottom line is this. Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, if we want it to be, can be more than a pleasant memory in the minds of us adults. It's also a resource. It is a blueprint. It's something that if we study, can help point the way forward for schools and for school districts and for learning spaces across the country. And I use that term, learning spaces, intentionally, because as Greg will tell you, Fred knew that learning happens everywhere. Many of you, most of you, maybe all of you are familiar with Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So I want you to use the chat function again. Just make a list of all of the places we got to learn with Fred. Where did we go? Where, where were we with Fred when we learned? Factories, absolutely. A community pool. We're at home. So I'm like, oh, a zoo. So I love these responses because, right, this wasn't Mr. Rogers' house. It wasn't Mr. Rogers' classroom. It was Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. We got to go to places like crayon factories, the library, the music shop. We went to all of the places that you're listing in the chat right now. The list goes on and on. The point being that Fred built a neighborhood. Now, of course, he knew that classrooms and school like St. Matthew are critical. But he also knew that they're just part of a learning landscape, a learning landscape where learning happens everywhere. And part of the reason that Ryan and I wrote this book is because for the last 15 years, we've been building a learning landscape like this right here in Fred's, Fred's backyard of Western Pennsylvania. You see, in our corner of the world, Remake Learning is a professional network of educators in and out of school, early childhood through higher education, who are working together to reimagine learning. It's a network that involves thousands of people representing more than 600 schools, museums, libraries, early learning centers, after school programs, creative industries, and campuses of higher education, all of whom are working together to create more relevant, a more engaging, a more equitable learning landscape for our young people, whom we all know are navigating these times of rapid technological and social change. And because Remake Learning is situated here in Western Pennsylvania, we often say that the people involved are using the FRED method, referring, of course, to Mr. Rogers. Now, when we say that, we mean that they're going about their work as FRED did. They're connecting what today we'd call whole child frameworks with what we're learning about learning itself. Think of it like a simple equation. Whole child, meaning the academic, social, and emotional growth that every child experiences, coupled with all that we're learning from the science of learning. Whole child plus learning sciences equals the Fred method. In so many ways, our book springs forth from this incredible learning landscape that we call Remake Learning. It's a landscape where we're constantly asking, how might we? How might we apply the Fred method in our schools and at home? How might we make all sorts of little bets, 
the little things that you and I can do to support the kids in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our school classrooms and beyond. And what are the signals to which we might look as we look in the world around us? Tonight, as we share some of Fred's tools for learning, we're gonna share some of these little bets, the types of things that you and I can do, drawn from examples of things in the world and inspired by this Fred method. So if we're going to build from Fred's blueprints, we're going to need to use Fred's tools. Now, these are the same tools that today, scientists, educators, and employers all consider essential to children's lifelong success. And they're the same tools that Fred himself celebrates in this short video. Now, I think we might be having a little bit of a tech issue in which Greg and I can't actually hear this. So I'm gonna rely on you all again. I'm gonna start this video in just a second. And if I could get a few more thumbs up to make sure you can all hear it, I'll, I'll know that we're on the right track. Can you all hear this? Mm, I can't. It looks no, like they can't hear. No, okay, interesting. That's a new issue. Well, anyway, Fred focused on curiosity. He focused on creativity. He focused on all these things that help grow the garden of the mind, which is what Fred is singing about in this video that you can't hear. These are Fred's tools for learning. He said, I'd rather give children the tools for learning. If we give them the tools, they'll want to learn the facts. And more importantly, they'll use the facts to build and not destroy. Fred knew that academic learning has to be paired with a nurturing of what's best in us, that one without the other is insufficient. He knew you needed both in order to raise complete human beings. And here again, learning science is proving Fred Rogers right. That's right, Ryan. And if you can, put that link for Garden of the Mind in the chat, if that's even possible. So Fred's tools for learning might be more important now than they were during the time that his program aired. And scientists, parents, employers, just about everyone else says that Fred's tools are essential to our kids' success, especially in this age defined by algorithms and increasingly smart machines. Now, one of the most amazing examples of this comes from, it's, it's sort of a tiny little California-based company that maybe you've heard of. It's called the Google. So <laughs> I'm guessing maybe if you, some of you have heard of the Google. Now, the Google, a few years back, decided they wanted to figure out what makes for a good boss in this company. And for a long time, they assumed, you know, we are the world's best programmers. We automatically probably make for the best managers, right? Now, this is an exaggeration, of course. And fortunately, Google being Google said, you know, we should test this assumption, like who makes for the best managers? And they did it through an internal project that they called Project Oxygen. And through Project Oxygen, they analyzed tens of thousands of data points to which they had uh, you know, access, things like employee surveys and exit interviews and all sorts of data that they were able to compile. And they found, yeah, you know what? Technical expertise matters in terms of leadership in this company. The ability to write code in your sleep, that was important. But they found that among the things that mattered most, technical expertise ranked last. The other more important things were things like building good relationships, things like caring about your employees and their well-being. The people who succeeded at this company called Google had all of these qualities that Fred taught so well, these very human qualities that can't be replaced by any machines. And you know this, when we help kids to develop these sorts of qualities, not only are we giving them the tools to succeed in, in their professional lives and civic lives some days, but more importantly, we're giving them the tools right now to discover themselves to discover what intrigues them, what bothers them, what moves them and what brings them joy. You see, Fred's tools have been shown to boost academic outcomes, mental well-being, and even physical health. They're up to 10 times, 10 times more predictive of children's long-term success than any test that we can give them. And they cost almost nothing to develop and they hinge on the very things that make our lives worth living. Self-acceptance, close loving relationships, and a deep regard for our neighbors. So in our book, Ryan and I, in each chapter, focus on one tool for learning. And tonight we wanna to walk through three of those chapters. Yeah, so the first tool for learning we wanna focus on is curiosity. So in 2007, there was a psychologist named Michelle Chenard who published a really interesting study. Chenard and her colleagues recorded four children from the time they were 14 months old until they were just older than five. They were trying to figure out what is it the kids do 
when they're left to their own devices? What do they talk about? And so they came up with this uh, experiment in which they literally put tape recorders on little kids. They collected hundreds of hours of recorded conversation. And even though their sample size was small, just four children, what they found was revealing because when these four kids were left to their own devices, they tended to do one particular thing. And any of you who've ever spent time with little kids can probably guess what that one thing was. They asked questions. They asked a lot of questions. In fact, these four kids asked on average more than a hundred questions an hour. So suffice it to say that kids are curious. Kids are inherently curious. The world is a big, beautiful, messy, dirty, dangerous place, and they wanna know how it all works. And we know from modern learning science that the more curious kids are, the more their learning sticks. Susan Engel is one of the world's leading experts on this. And she says that inciting children's curiosity is the best way to ensure that they'll absorb and retain information. So you'd think that as adults, as parents, as teachers, we'd have our work cut out for us, right? Inciting curiosity is the most important thing. But as you probably remember from your own time as a student, that's not always what we get when we go to school. In fact, when Engel herself went out into the field to study this, this is what she found in kindergarten. In any given two hour stretch, we'd see anywhere from two to five questions or explorations. In fifth grade classrooms, a typical two hour stretch of time often did yield one student question. So that's two hours in some classrooms when we know that some kids, at least under the right conditions, would ask upwards of a hundred questions an hour. How do we bridge that gap? How do we tap and nurture the natural curiosity that children bring to us? Well, fortunately, Fred left us some blueprints. One of the most important things he learned from his mentor, Margaret McFarlane, was the Quaker philosophy, that attitudes are caught, not taught. He knew how important it was to model curiosity himself. So if you pick basically any episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, any episode, any scene at random from almost 900 episodes, you'll find him doing a couple of different things. You'll find Fred telling viewers about the things in the world that fascinate him. You'll find him talking about all the questions he has. You'll find him bringing us things that make him curious. You'll find him singing songs like, did you know? Did you know when you wonder you're learning? Fred knew how important it was to show children that he's a learner too, and that wherever they go together, whatever they do, he'll be learning along with them. And this is why. It's what you bring to the children every day that he wrote to adults that encourages and inspires children to ask questions and, and to be imaginative. By responding thoughtfully to children's questions, you're encouraging their curiosity. Even when you don't know the answer, you're letting them know that it's good to wonder and ask. Now, in the course of researching our book, one of the most amazing people we talked to was a woman named Hedda Sheriffin. And Hedda told us a little bit about what this can look like in practice. One of the best, my favorite example she gave us is the Ask It Basket. Greg, you wanna talk about the Ask It Basket? Yes, and this is our first little Fred Method um, example for you. So Hedda shared with us visiting a classroom. Could, be, could have been a classroom at St. Matthew, an eighth grade classroom, right? She walks into this classroom and sees this incredibly large wicker basket taking up space in the front of the classroom and thinks, well, that's strange. Like that's an unusually large piece and it seems to have no purpose in this classroom. It's taking up space. But you know, I'm here to watch a master teacher at work. So she walks to the back of a classroom and watches this teacher do her thing, which is incredible, right? And what she notices during this classroom instruction is that the kids are asking all sorts of questions. Now remember, right? Like remember that data Ryan just shared from Mengel. These kids are asking questions and sometimes they're right on point with the, what, what the teacher is trying to accomplish that day in that classroom. And so it's pedagogically important for the teacher to acknowledge and answer that question in that particular moment. But more often than not, those questions are coming right out from over the left field wall. They're like, Wow, that's a, that had nothing to do with anything I just said. The wonderful thing about this teacher is that she's taking time to acknowledge the question, to notice it, takes a piece of paper, physically writes down this question, and then walks over to the ask it basket and puts that question in the basket and says out loud later together, we'll wonder about the answer or answers to your question. Now, there are lots of little things that happen in that moment. That student knows that she belongs in that space, that it's safe to wonder about the things that are on her mind for whatever reason they're on her mind. And that importantly, she's gonna have a caring adult who's gonna help her figure the things out that are on her mind. 
Well, that's something that you and I can do, even if we're not a teacher in a classroom, because a, a librarian can do it. Um, we can do it in our own homes. And as noted in the chat, you, these are parking lot ideas, but it's more than a parking lot idea because there's the, it's, it's, there's the opportunity to respond in that moment um, with deliberate intent. And so you could take a Tupperware container, uh, put it on your kitchen island counter, have some post-it notes there. And in the morning when your kids are asking all sorts of questions and you're like, ha, we just gotta get it out the door. <laughs> rather than saying like, hey, Alexa, what is the answer to the question? And I'm sorry if your Alexa's just went off, but you can write down that question and say, you know what, after school today, we're gonna to wonder why you um, think that's strange that those animals are crawling in the backyard, like whatever the question is, right? Um, now there's a modern example of this that comes from Carnegie Mellon University right here in Pittsburgh. And they equipped kids in 50 Head Start classrooms with digital cameras. And these kids took pictures of the things that were on their minds. Maybe it was the blue fish in the aquarium. And then they recorded an audio message and that image and that audio message was then sent via text to the parent, family, the caregiver, whomever was picking up that child at the end of the day. Now I will acknowledge there were times when I'd pick up my kids from their early learning center where I'd say like, hey, what did you do today? As if a four-year-old child was possibly going to respond to my question. But like, imagine if I'd gotten this text with this photo and like, hey daddy, I was looking at the blue fish. It, it provides uh, an on-ramp to ask questions, right? They're still open-ended, but it, it creates um, an opportunity to wonder. And that's something that you and I can do with our smartphones. We can do it with our old Polaroid cameras. We can say like, hey, honey, why don't you go in the backyard? Or why don't you go into your closet? Or why don't you go into the basement and just take pictures of things that you're noticing, right? And, and then you as the adult notice the things that are on the kid's mind, which then can prompt some really interesting conversations about the things they might be curious about that you might not otherwise notice. Yeah, I mean, what these tools really do is show children that their questions have value. Fred knew that kids have to know that it's okay to wonder. And Fred understood that kids have to know what's out there to wonder about. He knew it's hard for children, really that it's hard for adults too, to be curious about things that are totally and completely unfamiliar to them. So we're gonna do a little quick experiment tonight. I'm gonna give you all a name. And I want you all to tell me on a scale of one to five, how much curiosity that name stirs in you. How, how curious do you get when you hear this? One being, look, Ryan and Greg, thanks for zooming in, but it's 5.30. We got to get dinner on the table. My kids have homework. There's, we just have to move this along. And if that's how you feel, it's totally okay. We will not be offended. Five being, wow, Ryan and Greg. You all should move to San Mateo. So you can tell us cool stuff like this all the time. All right. The name is Angus the monkey. Tell us on a scale of one to five, you can just put your number in the chat, how much curiosity you feel when you hear Angus the monkey. Charlene's at a five already. I see some threes, some twos. Okay. Some fours, some ones. Usually there's a zero, which isn't even an option that I gave. I see some twos. All right. So we're, we're sort of on the lower end of curiosity because most of us don't know who Angus the monkey is. I'm gonna give uh, you a little bit more. Gonzalo said zero. Oh, thank you, Gonzalo, <laughs> there's always somebody. I'm gonna give you a little bit more information about Angus, Gonzalo. So Angus the monkey was a soccer mascot. And in 2002, Angus the monkey was elected mayor of a small town in England. When you hear that, where are we with curiosity? Give me your number again, one to five. Oh, I got a five already. Oh, I got, I got a 10. A six, Amazing. a 10. <laughs> Amazing. I still have a one. Aubrey, I see you. A couple of ones. I have a V. I'm not even sure what that is. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So for you holdouts, for you ones and twos still, I'm going to give you a little bit more information about Angus. So Angus the monkey actually served the term as mayor. And then Angus the monkey was reelected two more times. Where are you with curiosity now? One to five, I see fives, 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 four, five, 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 still a three, five, five, five. So if I were your teacher, if I were your parent, I could use that sense of wonder. I could use that curiosity to open up a discussion about voting, about election rights, really anything I want. And that's why Fred, whenever he introduced us to something new, he always started with what was familiar. 
He started with his fish tank, or he went to his sandbox, or he even started with a box of crayons. Before he took us to the crayon factory, he started with a box of crayons. Fred knew that curiosity doesn't spring from a void, but rather something that kids are familiar enough to help them form questions and to generate new ideas. Another signal in the world. Many of you out there probably watch the TV show Chopped. Now, if you're not familiar with Chopped, the basic gist of it is you get a few ingredients and they don't go together in any logical way, but you have to put them together to make something delicious. How can we take that signal and use the same concept in our homes and our schools? I'll tell you, when I was in graduate school, we had a class, a writing class, in which a teacher made us do a version of Chop to come up with stories. So we would take a character from one story, we would take a setting from another story, and we would take the style of the author of another story, and we had to blend them together to create something new. And it was that simple act of wondering about what's familiar. What might we do with what's familiar to create something new? that led us to our next tool for learning. And Ryan, I have to say, you don't even know this. I've started doing this in my own household with my daughter. <laughs> okay, you like Mr. Trepp? You like the Mr. Trepp series? Like, imagine Mr. Trepp is at Hogwarts. Like, where does the story go from there, right? It's just, it's, uh, it's fun to do. So uh, the second chapter in our book focuses on creativity. And Fred, more than anyone, protected our creativity. Back in the uh, late 1960s, George Land tested the creativity of 1,000 five-year-olds using a test he had developed for NASA, our space agency. And he found that 98% of those kids scored so highly that they qualified as creative geniuses. Think about that. 98% of those kids qualified as creative geniuses. As with curiosity, kids are naturally creative. And you know this. You know this as parents. You know this as teachers. Kids make up stories and songs, they draw pictures, they develop all sorts of ingenious solutions to the problems in your life that you go, huh, all right. Now, George Land and his team discovered something else because they tested that same group of five-year-olds every few years. And at 10 years old, the share of creative geniuses fell from 98% to 30%. At age 15, the share fell to 12%. By adulthood, it fell to 2% from 98% to 2%. Now what Land and his team concluded was not that our creativity naturally fades as we age, but that we learn non-creative behaviors. And honestly, y'all just need to go to one school board meeting, pick up one newspaper one day, and you can notice quickly that we've learned to be less expressive. We learn to be less open as adults to new ideas and new ways of thinking. We learn to be less innovative in our approaches to life's challenges, personally and professionally. And Fred Rogers talked about this. What happens if children hear that their mud pies are no good and their block buildings have no importance? So what is it that we can do to protect and nurture the creativity that kids are naturally born with? How are we gonna help them counter the non-creative behaviors that they'll inevitably learn as they age? Well, it begins with you and me. In the neighborhood, it began with adults. You remember, and you can picture Fred right now, every day we saw Fred engage in a creative pursuits that maybe some of us consider childish. We can see him sitting there in his kitchen and he's cutting felt and putting together popsicle sticks and he's painting pictures. Whatever it was Fred was doing, he made it clear that it was bringing him absolutely great joy. And you know, it wasn't just Fred. Do you remember the people that we got to meet in the neighborhood? Yes, we got to go off to crayon factories and amazing places. We also met some amazing people like Wynton Marsalis and Yo-Yo Ma and Julia Child. And Fred never focused on their accomplishments. He focused on the joy of what it is that they do, their passions. And it wasn't just these guest stars that we met. It was the people every day in the neighborhood. How many of you remember Handyman Negri? Handyman Negri, yes, was the handyman in the neighborhood. He was also the neighborhood guitarist. How about Officer Clemens? Officer Clemens, the policeman keeping the neighborhood safe, he was also the neighborhood opera singer. You see, all of these guest stars and all of these characters show that creativity wasn't just for kids and that we don't have to give up our creative pursuits as we age because these creative pursuits enrich our lives. Now, I wanna share a very personal example with you. And none of us, none of us wants to go back to the pandemic and, and certainly the first few weeks of the pandemic. And sitting here today, like, we're crazy. 
Because think of those first two weeks, like, hey, everyone sit out two weeks and we're going to be just fine. Well, during those two weeks, I had stepped into my garage. Um, this was before all of those Amazon boxes arrived and it was already like a scene from the TV show Hoarders. But somehow in the midst of that mess of my garage, I found my old Madrid skateboard. I used to skateboard all the time when I was a kid. I was a skateboarding enthusiast. And here in Western Pennsylvania, you know, it's hilly. And so we, we have natural skate ramps everywhere. I spent hours and hours and summer nights skateboarding. I'm now 50 years old. I have no idea what I was thinking at the time. I did not put on a helmet. I did not put on, um, you know, elbow pads, knee pads. I violated every safety protocol <laughs> that you all have in California. <laughs> and I got on my skateboard. And, you know, I live again in Western Pennsylvania. My skate, my, my driveway goes down and then the street goes down the hill. Um, what I'm really pleased to tell you is you can imagine I jump, jumped on that skateboard. I felt absolute terror. And I also felt incredible joy because all of those feelings came back to me. All of that time that I spent skateboarding came back to me. Happily, I got to the bottom of the cul-de-sac and I hadn't killed myself. But what I hadn't noticed is that my two daughters were running behind me. And it wasn't just my girls. It was six of their friends. Because they're probably like, dude, what is Mr. Bear doing? Like, they, I'm not even sure they'd ever seen Ryan a skateboard before. Do you know that today there are eight young women in my neighborhood who are skateboarding enthusiasts? Now, I am not a social scientist, and so I can't draw that line from A to B around correlation or causation, right? But we all know what happened in that moment. And Fred himself said it, because unbeknownst to me in that moment, I was the best teacher in the world, and I was loving what I was doing right in front of those kids. So before we move on, we are curious. We're curious about what you all love to do. What is it that you love to do more than anything else in the world? What is the thing that when you do it, you feel most alive? You feel most yourself. Now, maybe it's been 35 years since you've done this thing, or maybe you did this thing just this past weekend. Whatever it is, we want you to just take the next moment to think about what that thing is. What do you feel most alive? We have some folks sharing in the chat already. Being a teacher, hiking in the woods, travel. Snowboarding. Absolutely. Love it. Photography. Photography. Traveling and cooking, running Spartans races, Argentine tango dancing. Very. We have a great group here laughing. I know, and I love these Absolutely. things. They bring them joy. <laughs> I love, in the neighborhood, Fred reinforced again and again and again the importance of surrounding kids with adults who truly love to learn, adults who truly just geek out over wake surfing or reading or cooking. So if you're in the bear household, your thing now is skateboarding with your two little skateboard enthusiasts. If you're in my household, your thing, your skateboard, is just hanging out on the farm with this little guy. So the question for us as teachers, the question for us as parents, the question for us as caring adults is, how might we create more opportunities to light ourselves up in front of our children. What does it look like? Maybe we love to make music in GarageBand, right? Or maybe we love photography, or maybe we love Friday night football. So a signal in the world. Many of you probably know Friday night lights. Many of you are probably Friday night lights enthusiasts. Here in Western, Western Pennsylvania, it's a huge deal. And so two teachers took this idea of loving what they love and loving it in front of children. And they created this amazing little event because for them, their skateboard or their football is just reading good books, like a lot of you put in the chat. Now, reading is a solitary activity. So they thought, how is it that we can love reading? How is it that we can love literacy and love it in front of children? And so they launched this event called Literacy Under the Lights, in which they brought the community to the football field as if there were going to be a game. But instead of a football game, there were people from the community reading books about what they love. So we have the town barber here. <laughs> Excuse me reading a book about why he loves to be a barber. We have uh, the music teacher reading a book about why he loves music, what music means to him, and even letting kids play some instruments. It was the very embodiment of this idea of loving what we love and loving it in front of children. Now you can probably guess what the teacher in this classroom really loves, video games and amusement parks. And with permission from his school and with lots and lots of help from his school's parents, he transformed his classroom to look like this. And you can imagine the joy of this sparks, right? Not only in the teacher who gets to walk into the thing he loves most every day, but then 
the, in his students, his students who get to walk into this classroom and learn from a teacher who's lit up day in and day out by the things he loves. This is something that all of us can do at home. In fact, in their book, uh, The House of Make-Believe, two psychologists, Dorothy and Jerome Singer, outline what it takes to raise creative kids. And it's very simple, just four things. Kids need an adult who inspires, encourages, and joins in children's play. If you remember, that's what Fred Rogers was for many of us. It's something that all of us can be for our kids. They need a dedicated sacred space for that play. Now, it doesn't have to look like this. It might be the corner of your kitchen table or part of a basement. They also need unstructured free time, which is something you all know is becoming more and more rare in children's lives as they rush from activity to activity. They need that time to think, to play, to discover the world around them and discover themselves. And last but not least, they need simple objects that enrich the imagination. If you go to the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh, where Fred Rogers actually helped design some exhibits, you'll see that a lot of the equipment in there, a lot of the exhibits aren't very fancy. You'll find things like vats of mud. You'll find things like a real car. You'll find spoons and you'll find wooden blocks because they embody the Fred Rogers philosophy. They did simple objects that insp inspire and encourage curiosity. And speaking of simple objects, that takes us to the last tool for learning we want to talk about, which is connection. Greg, what was the simple object in this little case? Well, in the 1970s, Hallmark, the greeting card company, invited celebrities to design holiday displays for their flagship store in Manhattan. And one of these displays was noticeably different because it was a clear acrylic case, like the one here in the slide, filled with a single pine tree about the height of a child. It had no frills, no ornaments, no, no nothing fancy on it. It didn't even say who designed it. It only had a plaque that read this. Now, of course, we know who the designer was. If there was one message at the core of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, it was this, that I like you just the way you are. And though we don't always feel and think of feeling accepted as a basic human need, those feelings that we feel matter as much as food and water in our lives. Now, there are all sorts of interesting studies from the learning sciences about this, and I'd like to share just one, one that comes from this century. So a group of researchers gave some college level students a fake personality test and then assigned them to groups based on their supposed results. And they told one of these groups, you're gonna have rich, rewarding relationships throughout your lives. Your, your marriage, your partnership is gonna flourish. Your friendships are gonna flourish. It's gonna be really quite beautiful. They told a second group, you know, you're gonna have a marriage, you're gonna have a partnership, you're gonna have friendships, but you know, there'll be struggles and, and friendships and, and relationships will fade. But you know, that, that happens in human life with the chapters of, of decades, that, that sort of fray. And then they told the third group, oh, we're, we're still trying to figure this out. There's a lot for us to learn, but based on the results of your personality test, you, you're in for some rough times ahead, right? Like car accidents, falling downstairs. There's a lot of physical injury that is likely to be in your future. So just pay heed and good luck. And then they give all, all three of these groups an IQ test. Which of these groups bombed this IQ test? Is it group number one, group number two, or group number three? Take a moment in the chat, if you would, just put one, two, or three based on the results. Almost universally threes. It's almost universally. So I saw Ruth and Nadine. So you'd think the group that just received all sorts of terrible news would have bombed that test, but they didn't. In fact, group number three did just as well as group number one did. It was group number two. Now, why was it group number two? It was group number two because I just told them that their relationships were going to fray. And see, when faced with that news, when confronted with that horrific idea of fraying relationships, fraying connections, these kids lost the ability to think. They lost the ability to reason. They lost the ability to learn. Because on any other day, this group would have done just as fine as did groups number one and three. So it wasn't that bad news, but rather the prospect of being untethered in relationships. Now, fortunately, the researchers told all of these 
um, college kids, like, this is just a ruse. Um, this is not your destiny. Please go about your lives. But you can understand how important this work is. And in fact, brain science, brain science now tells us, and the mapping is there for us to see that the place in the brain where we might feel injury when we fall down the stairs is the same place in the brain that hurts when we feel like maybe we're not connected and that we don't belong, which is incredible to think about. Now, again, fortunately, these researchers apologized and assured them to, to move along, but all of this work underscores the message of Fred's radical acceptance that Fred knew that we all need the same thing, which is this, whether we're a preschooler or a retired person, we human beings need to know that we're acceptable, that we're worth being proud of. Kids and adults need to know that they matter to the people around them, that we're worth being proud of just the way we are. Now, this doesn't mean that we tell kids that they're perfect or everything that they say or do is good or even okay. But what it does mean is that we refuse to reject their humanity, that we refuse to make them feel less than, that we refuse to make them feel that their joys or their flaws or their full complicated selves somehow make them unworthy of the neighborhood. You know, there's a wonderful poem by the writer Raymond Carver called Late Fragments. Some of you might know this poem, it's very famous. And did you get what you wanted from this life? Even so, I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. At the end of the day, what is the thing that matters more than anything else? What is the feeling that all of us crave most? To call ourselves beloved, to feel ourselves beloved on the earth. So how might we create that feeling of connection, that, that feeling of belovedness for our kids and in our schools and in our homes? Sometimes we think the best way to answer that question is to think about how other people did it for us. So again, I want you to just think to yourself for a moment about this. What is the most memorable way someone has ever shown you how much they care about you? Now, if you want to share, please feel free to do so in the chat. I'll, I'll briefly tell you my story. So when I was in third grade, I had a classmate come to me and he said, hey, Ryan, I saw your dad in the library the other night. And my dad is not much of a reader. He would, a library is the last place in the world he would hang out. But it turns out that's where he was. He was there every night for almost two weeks because he knew that I wanted to play soccer but he didn't know how the game was played. So he was at the library every night checking out every book about soccer that he could because he wanted to coach my team. There are so many ways that we can show each other, that we can show our kids that we care about them, that they are worth being proud of just the way they are. What does this look like in person, Greg? Well, let's again share just some simple examples. You know, you're all Californians. I think of those red carpets down there in Southern California. We, we know what red carpets are, right? Like they signify something special and, and people dress up for them. And there's a lot of celebration around red carpets. But imagine that we put a red carpet at the entrance to our school, or we put a red carpet at the entrance to our classrooms, or even a red carpet in the entrance to our basements. Just a small physical signal that demonstrates and conveys a sensibility to our child or the students in our school that I am so glad you're here, that you belong here, that you're special, and that special miraculous things are gonna happen in this space together. I'm so glad you're here. What a Fred Rogers sensibility conveyed by something as simple as a red carpet that we could go buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. Here's another simple example. Some of you might be familiar with the game Cornhole. If you're not, it's a quite a Midwestern game. There are these two wooden boards, you're throwing bean bags from one board to the other, trying to get the bean bags to drop in the hole and you get points for each of them. At a local school, as parents and teachers wrestled with, what is it that we can do to attract, in this case, more dads, more guys to come into the school because our elementary school just isn't seeing enough of the men come into the school building. And we feel like we would be a better school and more connected to the community and it would better fit our kids if it was also the dads who were coming to the school. And they came up with this incredibly simple idea of what if we hosted cornhole tournaments on the campus of the school grounds? So they did, they, they bought all sorts of the cornhole equipment and they hosted a cornhole tournament. And you know what? 
the guys showed up because they want to play cornhole. And as they did, and they're playing cornhole, who's standing next to them? The art teacher, the school counselor, the school principal saying, hey, I'd love for you to come to the art show in two weeks. You'd be amazed by what your daughter's done. Or, oh my gosh, your son is bringing home a poetry journal. You really ought to take a look at it. I'd love to hear from you what you think about it, right? It was, a, it was like a red carpet, but different. It was a welcoming environment that was familiar to those guys, that connected to them, and, and provided that sense of connection and relationship and belonging in a small way that then connected them in bigger ways to the school and contributed to the quality relational experience of that school to its community. And what these little things add up to is more or less an atmosphere. So a reporter once asked Fred Rogers, you know, describe the neighborhood to me. Uh, what is it? What what are you trying to accomplish with this with this uh, children's television program? And when Fred responded, he actually didn't call it a TV show. Instead, he called it an atmosphere. He said, Mr. Rogers neighborhood is an atmosphere that allows people to be comfortable enough to be who they really are. All of us have a role to play in creating that atmosphere. That's why Fred left us his blueprints. The truth of Fred's ministry, wrote his wife, Joanne was that every last one of us can be as caring, kind, and influential in children's lives as he was. Every last one of us can do a version of what Fred did. You all are proof of that. St. Matthew's is proof of that. Which brings us to our penultimate lesson. The greatest thing we can do is let people know that they are loved and capable of loving. Now, this is a quote of Fred's. There's not really much that Greg and I can add to it, except to help us all remember that we are loved and capable of loving ourselves. So with that, as Greg noted earlier, we are going to close by doing an exercise that Fred himself used to do when he gave speeches. And we think that this exercise sums up everything Fred did. We think it sums up everything Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was about. And so I'm just going to read it to you all word for word. From the time you were very little, You've had people who have smiled you into smiling, people who've talked you into talking, sung you into singing, loved you into loving. Some of them may be here right now. Some may be far away. Some may even be in heaven. But wherever they are, if they've loved you and encouraged you, and wanted what was best in life for you, they're right inside yourself. And we feel that you deserve some quiet time on this special occasion to devote some thought to them. So let's just take a moment in honor of the people who have cared about us all along the way. One silent moment. Greg and I will watch the time. At the turn of a millennium, Fred issued each of us a challenge. Try your best to make goodness attractive, he said. That's one of the toughest assignments you'll ever be given. And Fred was right, it is tough. It's easier to tear down than it is to build. It's easier to criticize than it is to create. It's easier to fear thy neighbor than to love them. But if we want every child to have the freedom to discover her potential, if we wanna raise creative, curious, caring kids, if we wanna build stronger, more inclusive communities and a more just and loving world, then making goodness attractive is what we must do. And whomever it was that you were thinking about during your one silent minute, maybe it was a parent, a teacher, a friend, maybe it was your principal, maybe it was Fred Rogers himself, he or she is living proof that making goodness attractive is possible. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, how will we do the same for our kids? That's our charge. And that's why each of you is here at this moment right now. How will you take Fred forward in the ways that you can? Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all. It's been such a pleasure to be here tonight with you all. Thank you so much, Greg and Ryan. That was just beautiful. Just beautiful. Mark, I'm going to pass it to you, Principal Nava, for some final words. Just want to reiterate the thanks for um, 
to uh, to Greg and Ryan for being here this evening and for sharing these insights with us as we continue in the formation of our students, mind, body, and spirit. And um, parents, we're partners with you, and and we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to take in these tools and resources. And we hope to, um, to continue that partnership with you for, for years to come. So thank you again. Have a good evening, everyone. And we'll see the students tomorrow. Tomorrow's a new day. It's a beautiful day in your neighborhood tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. It is indeed. Greg Baer and Ryan Rudzeski, thank you so much for a beautiful presentation. We all feel inspired. Look at all the love that's coming your way. Right? <laughs> thank you thank all. You, everyone. Thank you, St. Matthew. Bye. Principal Nava, good night, everybody.